So welcome to the uh, show, Milan. And I thought you could start by uh, setting the scene with an overview of the kind of technologies we're talking about here and the sports that you're involved in. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Russell. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of the podcast, and um, I'm happy to talk about um, you know the subjects that I'm managing at SAP sponsorships and um, and the kind of technologies we're using there. Maybe to start off with, um, one thing to highlight is really that. You know, if we enter a sponsorship, um, it's not the typical approach that you would see um, in marketing in general. Um, for us, um, a sponsorship always means a partnership as well um, in terms of collaboration, co-innovation, and the usage of technology, SAP technology. Um, so obviously SAP as, a, as an innovative and, and uh, forward-thinking tech company, um, has latest technologies to um, you know, deal with huge amounts of data and provide added value back to our partners. And this is the approach that we took um, with each of them. And um, yeah, the two areas that I'm responsible for are tennis and um, more recently esports as well. And um, both of those properties are making um, big use of our technology in, in various um, you know, areas with the athletes, with the players, with coaches and media. Well, the, the esports is, is a really interesting one, actually. I want to come back to that. But just focusing on, on tennis, which you, which you just mentioned there, um, what I'm keen to understand is how the data analytics is being used by both the players and, and the coaches. Absolutely. So um, as an example in tennis, um, we started the journey with the Women's Tennis Association, the WTA, um, around about 2012, uh, so about seven or eight years ago. And uh, we really took the approach to speak to the uh, so-called end users first. So we got in touch with players and their coaches and um, we asked the question, okay, what keeps you awake at night? What are you missing um, in terms of access to data and information in order to improve your performance on the court? And it was very interesting to see um, the different approaches that, you know, the different coaches would take and um, in terms of how they interact with their players. Um, but in general, in tennis, you know, um, you have kind of an unchanged environment at each tournament and the data that can be generated from that environment can be used uh, to do different kinds of analysis about the game. And so this is the approach we took. Um, we are looking at roughly two uh, data sources. One of them is the um, umpire um, tablet, uh, which is used to put in, you know, uh, things like scores. Um, but then also, you know, an automated data source, which is the electronic line calling system, which is also being used for challenging umpire calls. And um, this system is uh, mostly, you know, consists of eight to ten cameras around the court. And um, we're receiving the raw data stream from that system. And so then you can imagine, um, you know, these cameras tracking movement of the players and also of the ball. So every hit point, every bounce point um, is running straight into our system on SAP Cloud Platform and we can digest the data and, um, you know, and send back that information and insights to anyone who's in need, uh, primarily the coaches on the, uh, on the side of the court. Is this what we know as, as Hawkeye? Is that the same? Is that what you're referring to? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hawkeye is one of those providers, but there are more in the market by now. Can you maybe share some more detail on how you're working with a, you know, a, a tennis coach at the moment on, on something specific, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, the most recent functionality that we added to our SAP tennis analytics um, suite is called Patterns of Play. And um, it's got a bit of a background story. So we've, you know, same as we worked with the coaches in the past, uh, we also took the approach here and asked them, okay, what, what are you missing? You know, you, you get the ball plotting for serves, you get rally shots, stuff like that. But most of them are really interested in, okay, uh, the sequences of rallies and then figuring out, you know, what a player or an opponent would be doing across multiple shots at certain scores. So we really look into that and um, put that into a user interface, which is, which is easily usable by anyone. Um, we ran a first prototype last year um, during Wimbledon where we, you know, we reached out again to the coaching community. We showed them what we have. Um, and it was funny because some of them uh, basically wanted to use it straight away to, to prepare their players for their next matches. But it took a little bit more time then to uh, really make it ready and production ready. Um, 
but this is kind of one of the examples how we really translate uh, a requirement that we hear in, in, in the community and uh, within the target audience and, and convert it into a piece of software which then can serve um, a wide array of people um, and gives enough flexibility for them to make their own use of it and create their own analytics based on the data that we provide. And, and what about the experience of the fans though? Because um... Yeah, you know, so so take Hawkeye as an example. I mean, I you know I personally think it can really enhance the viewing experience. Sometimes you know it gets quite fun watching. You know, if a player's you know questions a certain call, and you know you start to see the replay, and all the fans are, are starting to cheer. Um, but then at the same time, if you take something like VAR in football, um, you know I personally think it, it it's kind of killing the game, or certainly as a you know for the experience of the fan inside the stadium when you're just sitting waiting to find out you know what's happening and then you've got things like you know the stats that they show when you're watching tv you know which again quite, quite can be quite fascinating but when the lights of i don't know sky bt sports um you know show a, a chart with like percentage completion rates and and it includes things like defenders passing three foot to you know to their teammates which is which is a meaningless stat do you think sometimes it it can go too far and be, get a bit ridiculous in that respect yeah, look, I think um, one part of the process um, of us working on sports is also collecting that kind of feedback and getting in touch with the target audience. And, yeah. um, it's actually, you know, really quite surprising and also satisfying to get, you know, loads of different feedback. So there will be people who will tell you, you know, I don't see value in the stats. I just want to watch the game and enjoy myself. And any additional information is ju just makes it more complicated or harder to digest. Um, that certainly happens and exists and that needs to be respected that's fine um, but i think you know um, any kind of additional contextual information about what you see on the screen is ultimately beneficial um, if it's done the right way um, and i think that's the decisive point here um, it's kind of a balancing act of you know not overwhelming the audience um, but at the same time providing them with insights which really enrich their viewing experience mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, uh, you know, going back to tennis, um, if you give the audience just the speed of a ball, then, you know, it might be a fun fact, but, you know, there's, it's, it's somewhat meaningless. It's, it's without a context um, or like, let's say, a second serve percentage for a particularly strong player um, can be interesting. But if you have no context, then there's no point. But um, if you then put it in context with the serve speed and maybe the scores at which the, the, you know, the success rate is achieved, then all of a sudden there's a story behind it. And this can be picked up if it's presented well, then it can be picked up by any fan because it's intuitive and it makes sense. Or it can be, you know, picked up by a commentator and they can spin their story about it. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's, it's a fine line between, you know, finding, finding the right stats, presenting them the, the right way and essentially boring and overwhelming the audience. So that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's an important thing to, to look at. And um, uh, this is why we're always in touch with, with the target audience as well. Sure, sure. Okay, and then let's, let's move on to this area of uh, esports, which, I mean, it's just huge business now. You know, players earning serious money, massive sponsorships. Tell us about the work that you're doing with Team Liquid, who are a professional esports organization, aren't they? Yeah, Team Liquid is actually a very interesting organization. They've been around in the market for about 20 years by now. They've been, um, they've been founded in the Netherlands um, as a clan originally. Um, and uh, they're really a great partner to us. Um, esports as an industry um, has been around for a while as well. It was just somewhat under the radar for a long time. Um, and it started, you know, coming to the surface in, in like, let's say, recent years, um, you know, going, entering now the big stadiums, attracting, you know, huge amounts of people really going into the stadium, you know, 15,000, 20,000 seat stadium and watching players play something like Dota 2 or League of Legends, um, yeah. which I think 10 years ago would have been, <laughs> you know, um, unimaginable. Um, well, it, it's... it's yeah, it, hit, it kind of hit the headlines over here in the UK last year, I think, you know, for, in terms of mainstream, because on the news, because there was a, uh, a, a UK teenager who came second in the Fortnite uh, championships right. yeah. and, and won yeah. like a million 
dollars or something and and yeah. um so so that became like massive you know new you know headline news here really absolutely yeah yeah it's it's drawing in a huge audience and uh, for us at sap it's um the reason why we entered esports um, is twofold um, the main reason is really that we see the opportunity to tap into that community of young people um who are you know, um, supposedly tech savvy. Um, they typically have a background in some kind of uh, computer science or informatics disciplines, um, which makes them very interesting for us, of, of course, as a tech company and as an employer. So in a nutshell, it's employer branding for us, um, really get into the faces of these young people and make them aware that, that, that there is SAP in the market and, and we also have cool jobs and uh, can offer cool careers. And then the second reason is uh, it's really quite simple. Um, esports is, a, is completely digital by nature. And um, the, the amount of data that's being generated in every single game is just vast, right? So, and we have the means and the tools to digest it and, uh, and to process it. So that's a really good fit for us. And um, these are the two main drivers for us why we wanted to enter esports and um, and also to try to you know um, add some value back to that industry which is uh, growing at a very high rate at the moment yeah i just want to get your opinion on something i looked at team um liquids website and um on it they state so they've got over 60 championship caliber athletes is how they describe them in 14 of the world's top games and i stress the word athlete on purpose what would you class esports players as that I think that question would really uh, provide enough material for another hour long discussion, but um, I tend to be really quite diplomatic about it. I think it's also not really a relevant question, if that makes sense. Um, I know that, you know, people kind of look into making that difference between esports and let's say traditional sports. But in my personal opinion, I think there's a world where both can coexist. Um, yeah. You know, esports is a competition format, which, is drawing the masses and uh, there are professional players doing it and i'm, I'm not have... i'm not suggesting they're not talented obviously and and the yeah. skill and the training and everything like that i just thought it was an interesting um description sorry absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely i think you know the i think the the effort that a professional let's say football player has to bring in is obviously very different than you know, an esports player would have to bring in to play League of Legends. Um, it's not the same physical effort, but then there's the mental effort. There's sure. a little bit of a physical element to it as well, because you have to be very, very good at your mechanical skills with, you know, the mouse and the keyboard. But then it's also a lot of understanding for the game's uh, complex mechanics. Um, and then there's, there's a competitive aspect to it. So you're really under pressure when, when you're on stage and playing that's true. another yeah. professional team. And yeah. so there's, there's a lot of, let's say, <clears throat> you know, uh, joint elements between traditional sports and esports. Um, and again, like uh, the competition formats now really reach a level of, of prof professionalism, which um, is somewhat comparable, but of, of course, um, tra traditional sports have been around for a long time. And yeah, there's also quite significant differences between those two ecosystems. Yeah, of course. And just going back to traditional sports then, I mean, um, I mean, obviously there's, we're recording this, um, you know, we're, we're still in lockdown to a certain point and, um, you know, there's very little traditional sport being played, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we're recording this, German Bundesliga is back, but playing in empty stadiums. We've yeah. just heard from um, the English Premier League is going to be doing, you know, something um, is, is going to be restarting soon as well. I actually watched one of those, um, the, one of the German games recently, and you know it was just really weird that there was like no atmosphere. It was like a, a pre-season um, kind of friendly match, and I, I was just thinking it was like hard to watch. It must have been really hard for the players to actually play in that. And I was just wondering what you think the immediate future for sport is. You know whether or not this is going to create an even bigger opportunity for for esports potentially. Yeah, I think so. So two things. Um... I am, you know, it's, it's still to be seen and to be proven whether we really, let's say, come out of that crisis or if, you know, certain things in the world is going to be changed, maybe not forever, but for, for a long time. Um, I think to your point, right, when you look at uh, German football, um, they're trying various things to, let's say, spice it up a little bit, right? So they started off with empty stadiums and they put in some, uh, you know, almost like mannequins to... <laughs> To simulate an audience. Um, I've seen 
actually today or maybe yesterday I've seen a news bite about the Danish league, I believe, and they just put up big screens where people could essentially dial in and it would be like a giant Zoom call. So you would have people in the stands on the wow. screen watching. Um, but then you have the effect of, you know, people in front of the screen like like we are right now. Yeah. They would be like eating or they would be drinking and then it's it's really weird as well. Yeah. So I think you know, I, saw, no I, saw, I actually saw one person uh, on the news suggested a really good idea. So where, like the, where, where those mannequins are, they said, wouldn't it be great if you had one in your seat with a webcam so that yeah. you could log on and still get the same view that yeah. you would have if you were sat in your, in your normal seat, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I, I don't think there's a definite answer to, um, to fixing the problem, let's say. It's, yeah. um, it's different kinds of attempts and... Um, all of them are somewhat funny, somewhat valuable. I think, you know, there's, there's a long way until yeah. we reach a certain degree of normality again. Um, and I think to your second point, the opportunity for esports is obviously um, there right now. I mean, esports as an industry has been hit by the crisis like every other industry as well. There's, there's no denying it. But also, um, esports is traditionally taking place virtually anyway. Right. Um, so I spoke to somebody, you know, within the esports ecosystem and they said something really funny to me. Um, they basically said they feel like five years ago because now everything that was supposed to happen on site in a stadium is again transitioned back into being completely virtual with the players being, you know, at their homes, yeah. competing virtually, the, you know, the broadcast being managed um, remotely. This is what it was in the past. And then they pushed into the arenas and they and now they have to kind of take that step back but with the experience of another five years of organizing professional esports events so it's still a step forward but it's kind of a different approach and a different direction right now and you know given the fact that traditional sports had to pause for a while and still has to pause and esports is ongoing um i think yeah the the viewership is good and and the opportunity is there um and I'm not just talking about, you know, events like in, in Dota 2, which is one of the biggest esports titles where you have back-to-back -back tournaments literally right now every month. Um, but there's also the approach of, you know, taking traditional sports to a virtual event. Um, so like virtualizing something like football, virtualizing Formula One, Formula E, um, which works better sometimes, uh, sometimes better, sometimes worse. Um, they're taking the approach of taking, you know, uh, involving the um, the actual athletes and playing that game on a PlayStation, for instance. Um, you know, it's um, people get creative these times. Um, yeah. Again, I think there's no definite answer, and we have to see how it evolves. Yeah, fascinating stuff, uh, Milan. If um, listeners want to find out more about what SAP are doing in this space, where's the best place for them to go? The best place to go to learn about what SAP is doing in sports is uh, most likely social media. Um, so just uh, look for the channel SAP Sports and Entertainment on Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram. Um, we're pushing you know, content on a regular basis and there's a good variety of, of sports in our portfolio. So everybody should find something that they like. Tremendous. Uh, Milan Czerny, thank you for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, thanks so much for joining me, Angela. It, it's the work, obviously, I'm, I mentioned that, that you're doing now at Sports Innovation Lab that we're keen to chat about. Can you give us a quick intro to the business and, and some of the brands that, that you're working with? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Sports Innovation Lab at our heart, we're a market research and strategy company. Um, where we go deep, however, is we focus on the intersection of sports and tech. Um, so ultimately, what we're aiming to do is help our clients create breakthrough fan experiences through technology. We really believe that technology unearthed massive opportunities in the sports industry. And as you can see, tons of, uh, of technologies are coming in um, and this market is reshifting. Um, it's, it's, there's an opportunity, again, to innovate, do things differently with the ultimate goal of, of the fan, of the consumer. So. Um, with all my background, obviously, on the business side, as an athlete, sitting on international boards, um, I saw an opportunity to help the industry understand the technology um, so that we can move forward and, um, and ultimately support those clients that are looking to actually create these breakthrough uh, fan engagement or experiences. 
Can you actually share an example of, of a current project just to kind of put it into context? Yeah, most of our clients are actually technology vendors that are looking to break into the market or have a, a capability outside of sports. Now they're coming in. Um, but on the sports side, um, so we service the whole market from agencies to leagues to teams to technology companies themselves um, to brands, um, all using tech in a different way. Um, one recent example was with a new league um, called Athletes Unlimited. They actually said, hey, if we could start from scratch, not be beholden to the old way of doing business in sports, um, what might that league look like if we're really looking to leverage technology and, and restructure this? So, um, so we actually created, helped to create a league called Athletes Unlimited um, that launches in, uh, in um, September around women's softball, but they're really, really thinking again, how to lean in and do things differently. Amazing. Um, with your work being centered around fan experiences, you just, you just you know, mentioned that earlier. I'm keen to get your take on how traditional sports are going to survive this, you know, this current situation in the immediate future if they can't bring fans to the actual games, you know, or, or at best, you know, based on social distancing, you've got, you know, these huge, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 seater stadium arenas. And, and if they can only hold a few thousand people in it, you know, that, that's, it's going to be just a strange situation. What, what's your thoughts on all that? That's a massive problem for the sports industry. Um, currently, obviously, the economic impact of not filling those stadiums from a ticket and revenue generation perspective, every league team is trying to figure out, are there other ways to create additional revenue streams? Tech could drive that. Um, but that being said, there are a lot of leagues think uh, the Premier Lacrosse League here in the U.S. that's fully quarantined themselves in a campus in Utah. Think UFC, who recently um, announced their Fight Island, again, a fully quarantined space for their athletes, for their um, support staff, without fans. Um, what are the ways that we can continue to drive engagement at home, continue to get fans to interact and, and love our brands and do things that drive ultimately drive revenue? Um, so we're seeing a lot of... Um, of return to play protocols, number one, are people safe? Assuming they are, can we post games? And then on top of that, um, you know, what can we do to connect at home? Now in the future, again, pretend that now fans are gonna come back maybe 20, 30% of full capacity. There's a massive opportunity um, at, that we're seeing in the market, again, to help with these ways that are gonna keep fans safe and, and, and uh, have trust, create trust. So think about, Venue Ties, a company that, that really focuses on a full suite of solutions um, that could be you know, something as simple as cashless. Uh, think clear facial recognition. Think, think ways that, again, you could minimize the potential impact of COVID, assuming that fans are coming back still with social distancing in mind. So there's a lot of these companies, again, that are, um, that are creating um, a way that you can watch at home and be more engaged now at home than, than pre-COVID because again, if we can't get up and go, we want still that sports experience. Um, but then when we move into another phase where a limited amount of fans are coming back, it's like, it's all about trust. Yeah. Technology actually is a, a, a cornerstone of, of that. I, I read on your um, website that your blog about the future of all sports is digital and, and you went into this, um, you know, the concept of, the, of the, uh, the fluid fan. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, fluid fandom, that is the core of our of what we do. Um, you know, fluid fans, again, the, the pillars to a fluid fan are open to change. Um, these fans don't look like they used to. They're not the diehard, so to speak. Um, they're empowered to choose. We've essentially given them more ways than ever to uh, engage with, with properties uh, to reach them because of technology. Think all the platforms out there. And they're continuously evolving. You think you know them one, one day and they're very different the next. So fans today look very different. They're no longer tied to geography. Uh, they may follow players versus teams. Uh, they're super tech savvy, so you don't have to explain. You know, they're, they're they can find your content anywhere um, with multiple screams. They may actually vote on um, values, right? They might follow a team that, that is eco-friendly or, or diverse versus they're simply the best team out there. Um, so they want these accessible, um, sort of immersive experiences that, again, culminate in a very social, accessible, interactive experience. That looks very different than the traditional fan that we're used to serving, 
were, you know, maybe it's the diehard that you have to do little to nothing to entertain. You just have to put on sport. This new age fluid fan absolutely wants to do more. They may want to bet. Um, they may want to interact with the content. They feel like they have a direct connection to the, to the athlete, right? So you have to create ways through technology um, to allow them to, to be fluid, to find your product, um, to engage with your product, um, and to engage with one another. Um, at the end of the day, we say the diehard isn't completely dead, but they're dying. Um, and every fan, whether you're young, the majority of these fluid fans are young, but you could be a fluid fan yourself, even if you're older, if you're using something like a second screen. So fluid yeah. fans are the future of sport. Um, and we have to remember that, uh, that we can't do things the same old way. We have to innovate. We have to engage. We have to give them more than what they're used to. Yeah, just picking up on, on what you were just saying, there, there was something you mentioned there about following the, you know, some of the players rather than the teams. And, and I wanted to lead on to this, this area about the athletes themselves building their own um, brands. And because actually from my own personal experience, so my football team or soccer team, as you guys would call it, is, is Tottenham Hotspur in, here in, in the UK, in London. And you see, you know, that there's, there's a, a whole new group of fans that are at the ground and coming to the games purely because of our superstar South Korean player, Hyo Min Song, who's, who's you know, South Korean's captain and, and is like huge out in, in that part of the world. Um, earlier this year, you launched the, the Athlete Driven Media uh, Leadership Board. And, and so again, just reading up on that, it said to focus on the role of, of athlete data in sports media. I thought maybe we could just finish off with you telling us a little bit more about your aims for that and whether or not you think we're gonna to get to this point where because you, you, you see athletes, players negotiating, negotiating around their image rights. I was wondering if it's going to get to the point where they're owning their own data as well around all, all this area. What's, what's your thoughts? That's the future. Again, fluid fandom uh, is, is everywhere. It's global. Um, your, your, your example is, is spot on. Suddenly, with globalization, with the ability to trade players across geographies, to watch content uh, there are no boundaries um, and and fluid fans can pick and choose more easily. So athletes are a beneficiary of that. Obviously, the leagues um, are, are creating the structure and, and, and revenue opportunities, but the athletes are now building their own brands. That is a fundamental shift. They have the power to go direct to consumer, to be their own brands, to be the voice of the league. And whether they get traded or not, the fans, for the most part, don't care. They will still follow that player. Hmm. So with that new enhanced power that these athletes have, the question becomes, uh, what kind of data, what kind of information is that athlete going to share as a brand? Certainly, they're going to want to build up their social and digital following. Um, and there are a number of technology companies that are doing that on their behalf. Um, but there are other opportunities, think sports betting, um, where maybe you want to follow and understand their, their performance, their heart rate, their sweat production, things, these other data points that might actually give you another window into these athletes. So the question of who owns their data is absolutely a hot topic right now. Um, in my prior life, I served as the uh, chairperson for the IOC Athletes Commission. So I got to listen to all the athletes globally. Um, there's an opportunity here. I think, um, the, you know, again, the market is opening up. I think athletes will be the primary beneficiaries of this. Um, and it's a, it's not a, you know, zero sum game. I believe if the, the leagues and the technology properties and the athletes understand that the pie could be bigger for everyone. Um, again, this data is super valuable. We'll all benefit in the long run. And ultimately what we talk about at sports innovation lab is the fan, the fan will benefit because they'll, they'll be enabled by technology to actually connect to the athlete, to the brands that support those athletes, to the leagues and, and the properties and actually get access to you know, more across the globe. So it's an exciting environment to be in. Um, and we're really proud to be leading the way um, with this kind of research that's very data driven. That's a really big piece of, of what we do at Sports Innovation Lab um, versus just seeing trends. So all of our research is, is backed in, in this kind of information. Brilliant. Um, Angela, thank you so much for giving up your time today. If listeners want to find out more about that fluid fan research, but also more about, about the business, where can they go? Yeah, go to our website, uh, www.sportsilab.com. Um, you can find our fluid fan reports. Um, they're free. Any of our leadership board content that you mentioned before, athlete-driven media, 
smart venue. Um, we have a number of reports that are available. Um, we also have a podcast um, called Food Fan Podcast. You can find that on iTunes or um, a, a webinar, a weekly webinar series called Ask Me Anything. So go to our website. You can find everything. Um, but again, we are a market research company just focused on the intersection of sports and tech. And uh, I wish all your listeners the best understanding this space because it's super complex but super exciting at the same time that's great angela thanks so much for uh, for joining us today thank you so much for having me to join me is chris turner ceo of sports and well-being analytics um quite an extremely appropriately named a startup given the uh, topic of this episode uh, do you want to give us a quick intro to the company chris yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, so Sports and Wellbeing Analytics is a startup. We started a couple of years ago and uh, we're focused on using the latest technologies and scientific research essentially to uh, enhance player welfare, uh, safety and performance fundamentally. Um, obviously, the focus right now is on, on really on head impact. Uh, so that's the, the real focus we have right now. Uh, and we are also doing that in elite rugby union at the moment. Uh, although obviously we've, we've spent some time at university level, et cetera, but elite is where we're focused. Uh, and the way that we've done that is we've developed a product called Protect. And that is essentially a mouth guard, uh, which we've built into, uh, sorry, we've built a set of electronics into that mouth guard uh, in order to monitor and use and manage those head impacts from players. So can you explain how the, uh, the mouth guard works exactly? Yeah, of course. So essentially what we have, as I said, is, is a number of sensors. They measure linear and rotational acceleration of the head. So when we're talking about uh, linear, we're really talking about that straight line impacts forwards and backwards, and then rotation is obviously the, the, the full, full rotation. And the reason we need to do both of those is the types of impacts that we get. We want to know how severe that impact is, from which direction that is coming from. Uh, and we want to be able to look at that because different types of impacts have different types of characteristics. So you will find, for example, that if you look at professional rugby, because people are typically passing balls to the side, there's a lot of rotational movement in that. When we are talking about something like uh, an NFL game, for example, there's a lot more linear acceleration because the, the impacts are typically more generated from the side. Now, that's, that doesn't mean it's a universal truth, but it does mean that that's kind of a characteristic difference. Um, what that allows us then to do is we can then a first of all look at impacts that are seen and we can more importantly see the impacts that are not seen typically in a game you'll see lots of people around the side of the stadium watching players and they'll therefore look for those impacts that they have but we often see some of the biggest impacts actually are when people have missed them entirely because they're at the bottom of a rock or at the bottom of some other kind of uh, of, of pile up um, but that, that allows us to do all sorts of different things with that because we can then start to uh, look at you know, the timing of tackles, we can look at technique, uh, we can see what things actually are creating the largest impacts, we can look at using this uh, to see what we can do in terms of changing the way people train, etc. The biggest point really I guess is that we do that in real time, so we're actually looking at the impacts as they occur, so we're not looking for things to be delayed uh, and look at them after the event we we'll actually be able to react the sidelines able to react to those impacts as they occur which particularly for those unseen impacts is very important because typically we would have missed them before and what's the technology then that you're using how, how have you developed and, and built all this so essentially what we have is uh, at the heart of this is an sap harness system so so we use the real time and the Internet of Things capabilities within that to actually collect that data from the mouth guards. Essentially, you can think of those mouth guards as, as individual sensors that are transmitting their data to the sideline in real time. That data is then shoved into a HANA database. We then do a load of analytics on that to allow it to respond uh, and, and de decode all of that, in, that data. Uh, and then from there, we push that into the cloud when there's a whole load of analytics, which is using the uh, analytics cloud platform that we can then do as a, as a post event uh, set of work. So essentially that's how it, that's how it works. Right. And any examples that you can share, you know, in terms of who you're working with at the moment and also, you know, the benefits that, that they're seeing from, from using it. Yeah. So, so we've, we've spent a lot of time working with one particular team, which is the Ospreys rugby team in, in Wales. Um, and, 
we have got a lot of data from them. The big things that are really interesting is we're able to see what's happening during the training events. So we're able to see how players are interacting when they're training. So some drills will be more contact-based than others. Uh, and at those contact-based drills, we want to know who's getting the biggest impacts and whether those, those impacts are necessary or unnecessary, whether they're planned or unplanned, if you like. If they're unplanned, we can look at, with the club, we can look at the drills and determine whether or not to change those drills to reduce those impacts. Um, we've got a great example of what they call a jackal drill, which is basically a player on the ground um, who is passing a ball back in the form of this drill to be distributed out. But to make that realistic, they put people trying to take the ball off that player, known as a jackal. Right? We found that uh, when that was occurring, the guy on the ground was the only person getting any impacts. The problem with that is that the guy on the ground was the person that was not supposed to be getting any impacts because he was supposed to be out of contact and resting. And the idea was that that wouldn't be a requirement. So you can cheat, see you can sort of tweak things around like that. We're also able to get things like positional data. So we're able to use the data that we get off of, for example, individual positions like a winger or uh, a lock or whatever it is, and, and use that data to work out what a normal load for that player looks like. We're also then able to look at what an abnormal load for that player looks like by the same token. So we found that some players were getting impacts uh, later in the game that might be bigger than they were getting at the earlier part of the game because the way that they were reacting to that. However, what was actually happening was that their neck strength was running out, or the endurance of their neck strength was running out. So when they hit the ground, they kind of got much more whiplash than they would have got before. Uh, as a consequence, the, the size of the impacts went right up. So the consequence of that is you can either train the player to last longer, have their neck strength last for the whole 80 minutes, which may require a change in their strength and conditioning routines, or you can say, okay, that's how long they're going to last and I'll take them off after, say, 60 minutes and preserve them for the rest of the game. Um, it's, it's obviously an important issue um, that you're addressing and, and you mentioned NFL earlier and, and obviously it's been raised in boxing as, as well as, as another example. Are you looking to work with other sports beyond rugby? Oh, of course. I mean, this, th this technology is applicable to any contact sport, whether it's ice hockey or boxing or mixed martial arts or NFL or any of those things. So, yes, we, we, are, we are doing exactly that. In fact, we've got some, some exciting projects that we're working with in boxing and mixed martial arts oh, great. Uh, already. Um, I discussed with Milan earlier, um, you know, we're recording this as, as live sport is only just coming back after lockdown. Um, players probably haven't had very much serious contact sport as well. I haven't had any in terms of like actual sport, but possibly very little in, in terms of their training as well over the last couple of months. Is there a concern about the potential for more injuries to occur when play starts again? Uh, yes, there is. I mean, we've, we've seen, um, th there's a couple of big examples. So, so in 2011, the NFL had a lockdown uh, where the players were negotiating salaries again. And, and when they returned to play, we saw injury rates spike dramatically after that because they weren't adequately prepared for, during the preseason to, to return. Um, in fact, we, we saw the same thing in the Bundesliga as they returned after the COVID uh, interruption a few weeks ago. And we saw in the first week or so that the injury spiking four times what it was before the, the lockdown. So, so yeah, there is some, some considerable concern about that. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've tried to use our data for is to look at, can we help players return to that level of contact much more safely? And we've actually found some really exciting uh, insights from the data that allow us to help those clubs to, 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 to build out those, those returns to play. And we're working with a number of the premiership sides in the UK, premiership rugby sides in the UK, to help them with that return to play uh, approach. So as a result of all of that, we've built a, a return to contact white paper that allows to help clubs to detail out the processes that they, they can go through to, to, to achieve that. Great. Could you go through a little bit more detail in, in terms of what's included in that? Yeah. So, so essentially, when players come back, they need a certain amount of adaptation to get them used to what a normal contact load is in a game. So we've actually been able to use our data to determine what that normal contact load looks like. 
And we've been able to shape the training program to allow them to address that level of detail of contact exposure so that by the time they end, exit the program, which is typically sort of eight to 12 weeks, depending upon how conditioned the players are when they come into the program, they are ready for, for com normal levels of contact. One of the beauties of it is, of course, that we're able to simulate some of that contact even whilst players are in lockdown. They don't have to uh, do everything in with other players. They can do some of this in lockdown. So that means that they can sort of start that conditioning process to get themselves back up to the right initial starting point, even though they are not able to grapple with their play fellow players. And that's a big plus. And that's something that um, allows a lot of the clubs to shorten that return to play process from what would otherwise be a 12 week program down to eight or potentially less weeks. That's really interesting. If, if um, listeners want to get a copy of that report, is, is it on the website, I guess? Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a copy of it on the website, um, www.swa.1, and that's O-N-E. Brilliant. Uh, Chris, fascinating uh, discussion. Um, looking forward to the continuing uh, growth of your business. But for now, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks, Russ. Much appreciated. to now welcome uh, Preeti Shetty, head of Upshot at the Football Foundation, to talk to us about how data is being used at a grassroots level uh, to study the impact of sport in society. Uh, thanks for joining me online, Preeti. Um, we should probably start with a quick intro to the Football Foundation and then, you know, maybe tell us how Upshot has grown out of it. Uh, great. Thanks for having me. Um, so the Football Foundation is the UK's largest sports charity. Uh, it's a partnership between the Premier League, the FA and the government. Uh, and basically our role is to um, support and build grassroots football facilities, um, basically transforming communities uh, in terms of more people playing, better games uh, and ultimately stronger impact. In terms of Upshot, uh, Upshot is effectively an, uh, an online monitoring, evaluation and learning system that the Football Foundation founded back in 2009. Um, we as a funder were looking at all of the data that, that we were collecting. We would ask for an annual report from our grantees. And as you can imagine, back in 2009, we were getting that back in a variety of different formats, lots of paper at the time. And we felt very much that our internal insight teams were just collating data. They weren't really doing anything else with it. Um, and we wanted to move towards understanding this so what question. Okay, we've given you some money and you've engaged with a thousand kids this year. That's great, but so what? And we felt like the organizations we funded, you know, their clubs, community groups, schools, varying sizes, predominantly volunteer led, they didn't really have the resources or the capacity to be able to answer that question. Um, so we went down the route of, of building an online system to help them collect better data, report back to us, but most importantly, focus on, on the outcomes, being able to understand whether their interventions are working or not. What, what kind of outcomes are you looking to explore from that then? So predominantly, we'd be looking at any outcomes we think sport can have within a community or to individuals. So um, the government uh, a few years ago released their new sports strategy that focused on five key outcomes, physical well-being, mental well-being, uh, individual development, social and community development, and economic development. So really trying to understand, you know, if a young person or a group of people or people from a certain demographic are playing more sport, what does that mean for them? You know, are they having um, an increase in confidence? Are we seeing community cohesion? Are we seeing a drop in crime rates? We felt, and, and I think it's very common across sport, that a lot of this good stuff is quite anecdotal and there wasn't really any hard data and evidence that sat behind it to prove that sport does make a difference in all of these different ways and, and not just in terms of health. And it's not just the Football Foundation now that Upshot, I, I know you're part of that, but you're now working externally to that as well, aren't you? Yeah, so in 2012, um, we realised 
that while we had built up shot initially to, to work in-house for our grantees, um, lots of other sports and lots of other charities out in the sector had exactly the same problems as us. They were trying to answer the so what question. They were struggling with resources. Everybody was starting to look at technology as an answer to their problems. Um, we had done quite significant consultation with the sector as we were building Upshot, so we were quite well placed to offer it out to, to other organizations. So we launched commercially, if you like, in 2012, um, where we license Upshot to anybody who wants to use it. And, and they tend to be you know, predominantly a sport for development organizations or national governing bodies of sport or universities, local authorities, where they want to see a, an impact on, on society. Um, we currently work with just over a thousand organizations. The range has grown quite significantly. So lots of sports, like I mentioned, um, but we also work in 32 countries. We have the system in four languages. Uh, we work with, you know, tiny organizations um, in Iraq that use football to tackle landmine awareness, for instance. Um, we work with a brilliant organization in Brazil that uses boxing and martial arts to tackle crime and uh, and violence in favelas. Uh, we work with MLS clubs. So th the range is quite broad, but we all have something in common. We're trying to do something predominantly using grassroots sport uh, to be able to make a difference to our communities. Amazing. And, and let, tell us how it actually all works and how, how does the whole system work? So it's a cloud-based system and it's pretty straightforward in that it helps you collect all of your data at your sessions, if you like. So who's turning up? Where are they from? What do you know about them? What are their attendances at your sessions? But then it starts to go into quite a lot of detail around tracking individual journeys. Have you seen that, you know, their family situations have changed or they've got qualifications since they've been with you? And also quite a lot of qualitative data, photos, videos, case studies, you can do surveys. And then really closing that feedback loop you can share that learning with your funders and stakeholders and there's a reporting suite that enables you to understand if an intervention has worked or not um, and how well you're, you're doing against your key performance indicators. Uh, we recently launched um, two different apps, again, just to facilitate this easy data input. You know, we've all heard those stories of volunteers and coaches working really hard all day and then at the end of the day they go to the office or their home and they have to type everything in and for us it was moving away from that and saying actually we all use a phone why can't you have your phone out at the session you take a photo you do your register and your attendances job done delivering a really good service to the people that you work with so can you share some examples of the impact you've seen as a result of organizations charities or, or local teams using upshot yeah, so we see this at every level, really. Um, you know, for a coach or a team or a club that's delivering sessions on a regular basis, um, it's very much around organization and effectiveness. Do they know who's turning up? Do they know where they have to be, when they have to deliver? Do they understand their audiences? They can plan their sessions better. We see it as well at a, at a management level, you know, setting yourself KPIs, understanding whether you're doing well or not, informing future decision making. And then we see it right at the top. Uh, a lot of the work that, that we do feeds into national and international strategies. So it's being able to say, well, how does the work that I deliver on a local level or with you know, a particular demographic of people, how does that feed into my national government strategy? What impact am I making on crime rates in my local area? Um, a lot of the work that, that we do links into things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals. What is sports role within that? How do you know that you're making a difference in these areas? But really what it comes down to is about having really good data. It, it's telling you what's working. It's telling you what's not. If it's good, then you replicate and scale. If it's not working, you tweak and adjust. But the key thing is knowing it in real time. And I think that's what's made the biggest difference to our organizations is they've been able to catch something that isn't working early on as opposed to waiting till the end of the project and then having to start all over again. Yeah, that's, that's uh, really important, obviously. Um, and what about during this, this current crisis? Have you been looking at the impact that not being able to play sport at, at grassroots level due, you know, due to the threat of corona? Um, due to the threat of uh, coronavirus is, is having on society and, and our well-being as well. 
Yeah, it's it's had a huge impact, as as you can imagine. You know, lots of our organizations, their bread and butter is delivering out on a field or in a community somewhere. They haven't been able to do that. Um, they haven't been able to to reach their audiences. But we have really seen resiliency within the sector. Um, quite a lot of delivery has moved online. Um, I had a wonderful story the other day about um, one of our organizations that said, you know, your coach. Um, is like your mentor is, is, is a bit like your psychologist. You know, you don't just work with them, but you talk to them. And for lots of vulnerable at risk people, not having that interaction can be hugely detrimental. And we're seeing a lot of our coaches and our volunteers really starting to look at this very differently, move their work online, use the phone. Uh, a lot of this is going back to, to where we were before, just picking up the phone and having a chat with somebody. Um, for us, the most important thing, and I think that this realization, again, about real-time data, it's enabled our organizations to understand who are the most at risk, who are the hardest to reach, because they have all their details stored, they can access it from home. It is meant that they haven't had to stop delivering. Um, it's meant that they've just had to adapt how they deliver. Uh, and there's been some really wonderful examples, I think, of reaching new audiences, as we've seen all around the country, you know, exercise and sport is essential. It's, it's as yeah. important as food and medicine. And therefore, how do we ensure that we are reaching people who don't have opportunity or access? Um, just changing it slightly in, in terms of the area of, of online, um, Milan spoke earlier um, about SAP's work with Team Liquid and, and eSports. And I was just wondering what impact do you think eSports can have on social and, and community development, you know, alongside all the, all the other stuff that you're looking at? It's, it's a really interesting question because I think you have your sport purists that believe that eSport is in sport and, and whatever your view on it, I don't think we can dispute the, the reach and the investment that eSports has at the moment. Yeah. So I think if you're trying to tackle you know, complex social issues as we currently are, it would be remiss of us not to take them into account. Um, we're seeing some good examples already where traditional sport has started to partner with these sports. And while they are reaching very different audiences, it's about messaging. It's ensuring that, you know, no matter who your fans are, you are putting out the right message. And I think that can have a huge impact in, in terms of social and community. You know, we talk about young people that don't want to play sport because they don't like it or they don't feel that good at it but actually they may be really good at esport um and as long as we're saying you know especially we've seen this really strongly in, in in times of covid just a simple message wash your hands you know socially distance things like that can be communicated to a much bigger audience my concern slightly is you know if we go down this the separation route then esports becomes its own thing and we end up in competition with each other, which with, and I don't really think that, you know, that would help communities in any way. No, no. Interesting. Um, Prissy, it's, it's, it's great to include grassroots uh, sport in this podcast. And so it, it means that we, you know, we've, we've heard from the whole spectrum of, of how data is being used in the industry. So, so thank you so much for that. If listeners want to find out more about Upshot, where can they go? www.upshot.org.uk. Uh, and you can also find us on the Football Foundation's website. Very simple. Uh, Pretty uh, Shetty, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm now joined by Dr. Sarah Gilchrist, a performance consultant who brings 20 years experience to our podcast. Um, and that has included a leadership role at the English Institute of Sport, as well as supporting British rowing to multi-gold medal success at the Beijing, London and Rio Olympics and Paralympics. So, um, Sarah, thanks so much for joining me. Excited okay. to uh, hear about your experience of working directly with the athletes. Um, but before we get to your work with British Rowan. Um, I thought, can you maybe just tell us how much the use of data changed between those three Olympic and Paralympic uh, games that you worked on? Sure, I mean, the short answer is an incredible amount. Um, we went from um, using data within rowing in the Beijing Olympic Paralympic cycle, but the whole high performance system as a whole moved throughout those three cycles to utilizing data intelligence, employing more practitioners who were solely responsible for looking at data and feeding the insights back to coaches and athletes. 
to a place where now we have specific roles called data scientists. They, they didn't exist in the, in the Beijing cycle. Um, and it's quite common nowadays to perhaps combine a sports science degree with a maths degree um, or even computing science. So we're even moving away again from the traditional physiology, biomechanics, psychology of, of sports science to looking at people with insights to computer science and computer technologies um, to combine with their knowledge of, of what it takes to help an athlete um, cross, the, cross the winning line. Um, so, yeah, it's changed an incredible amount. Sure. Um, so tell us about your work with British Rowing then and, and how specifically, obviously, you know, related to the topic of the podcast, how the data analytics contributed to the team's success, which I'm sure was all about the work you did. <laughs> no, not quite. The athletes put <laughs> a lot of work in. Um, but yeah, sure, it was a huge part of what we did on a day to day basis. We worked in a multidisciplinary team. So we had coaching information we had telemetry on the boat from biomechanics so the science side of things the physiology which was my area so we were particularly looking at the the data that the human in the boat provided the athlete um, and we had data from um, also from the medicine side so you had sports science sports medicine and coaching technologies providing data that, that fed into a, a mothership of, of all the data and then it was how we use that data to provide us with insights as to from a physiological point of view how the athlete was coping with the training program moving through the training program in a in a four-year cycle were they getting to the point where we knew they needed to be to cross the cross finish line first and we were in the lucky position that we knew what a gold medal standard was and we had all the information off boat speeds off the water and predictions that we could make and difficult being an outside sport but predictions that we could make within reason as to how fast we thought the boats needed to be um, to, to win the races um, in the you know whatever conditions were thrown at us on that Olympic Paralympic final day um, and don't forget you have different boats as well you know with different numbers of people in and you have rowing and you have sculling and it, all these combinations of factors meant that we had an incredible amount of data that we had to make sure that we chose how we use the data so it was insightful and we weren't just using data for the data for the sake of it and just producing data and and feeding it back to the coaches and they looked at a piece of paper and then it, it never actually made an impact on the training program or the decisions that the coaches were making um, so it was a very much a team effort and that that changed as well over over the various olympic paralympic cycles to the point where certainly between london and rio they they started working with sas um, a computer software company purely to look at data management um, and that also um, transferred into the governing body as well and I know SAS helped them with British Rowing with membership for example which is obviously an, another database with, with large numbers in it but um, the relationship exists now and, and it's had a real impact in terms of mining the, the amount of data that the team produced can it get to the point though where there's too much data uh, you know that, that you're focusing on yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's why you have to be careful when you've got data coming in from the science and medicine, and then you've got coaching technology data, coaching technical data. Um, it's, it's very easy to have death by data in the sense that you're, you're just seeing numbers. And you need to remember that there's a, a human being on the, on, on the end of the, of the product that you've got. So whilst the yeah. information off the boat and the boat speed and the telemetry off the boat is really, really important, um, it's ultimately it's an athlete, a human being that's that's making that speed happen, and a combination of humans. If you've got more than one person in the boat, so the, the dynamics of how you use the data and the inferences you make from the data come back to the the art of um, coaching science. Is it an art or is it a science? And and that's where the relationship that you have with the coach is really important, and the relationship that the coaches and the athletes have is really important. And it becomes almost a, a collaborative, collective decision. Um, as to what changes you would make in a training program to make sure that you're adapting and responding to to the ultimate what it takes to win um, and so yes you can get death by data and, it, and really it, it comes back down to the, the skill of the coach and the scientists and the practitioners involved to be able to take a step back and say okay this is what the data is saying but you know look into the eyes of the athlete you know what are they saying you know how, how are they responding to the program that you know 
usually they're an experienced athlete who's been through multiple Olympic Paralympic cycles. They know how they should feel at this stage of the cycle, etc. And yeah, um, yeah. equally, if it's a, if it's a young developing athlete, that's when you've got to be really careful again because they're they're overly keen and they don't want to you know show a weakness. So you, you you've got to make sure that even if the data is saying all the right things, you've got to make sure that you're taking the human aspect into account as well. I want to ask you about the area you're focusing on now, because um, I also find this quite, quite fascinating. And that's the importance of sleep and how it impacts on performance. Why choose that particular area for your doctorate? Uh, it came about through a, a number of ways, mainly um, the fact that nobody addressed sleep and athletic performance or sleep and downtime and athletic performance. There, there was no normative data or current normative data on elite athletes and sleep. Um, and so it came from questions raised from the rowing team in relation to their sleep. And also it was the year before 2012 and we knew their downtime was being impacted. They were getting pulled into London for media commitments so ahead of the home Olympics. And we wanted to capture data on how that was impacting on their recovery. So th there was a whole host of, of factors, but essentially in terms of data, it was like, we, you know, we, we, have got an opportunity here to create a database on athletic sleep. So it's, it started with British rowing, but it transcended into other sports across the Olympic Paralympic spectrum um, in British high performance sport. And I was lucky enough that I got a PhD student working with me as well. So there was two of us gathering data, working in, in different ways in relation to sleep performance. Mine was more about the culture and behavior change and getting people to understand and educate them as to why this was important. And the fact that whilst we had determinants of performance from physiological, psychological, technical, all sorts of different aspects that determine performance, the, the real crux of it was that sleep was an impact factor on those determinants of performance. And so if sleep was being compromised in some way, then that would have, an, you know, ultimately over a time, over a four year period of an Olympic cycle, that could potentially have an impact on an athlete's ability to deliver on the day. Yeah, I was, so, I was, I was often, wondered actually that in terms of so so take football for example and mm -hmm. where you where players you know each week they've got a different kickoff time so one weekend they might be kicking off at say midday then they've got a, a, a midweek evening game at eight o'clock and then the following weekend they've got a four or four thirty kickoff and so you know their, their whole sleep patterns must change constantly to ensure that you know that they're, they're at the kind of peak come kickoff time is, is that really difficult to manage both for the players and the coaches it can be um depends very much on the sport um but yes to a certain extent it comes back down to the players taking responsibility as well um but being educated on what they need to do in terms of their sleep to ensure that they can perform optimally at the time they need to so if it's a late night game for example you've got the adrenaline of playing they might have had some caffeine to help with their performance on the pitch if it's football for example they might have had drug testing afterwards so then they're, they're late to bed and it could be the early hours um, so you know you've got to ensure that in terms of sleep routines sleep hygiene all the behavioral environmental factors that precede sleep that they have got a really good sleep strategy planned out for whatever it is that, that is their performance plan that what they when they need to deliver a performance so if they've got early morning games it's making sure that you know they're getting enough sleep usually seven to nine hours but they if they've got to get up early they're going to bed earlier so that they're getting that bank of sleep um so they're not sleep deprived on the day i mean one one bad night's sleep won't affect you too much but if, if they're playing two three times a week and their sleep isn't in a good routine then that's going to have an impact particularly over a season um so in terms of data that was huge you know you, you can record a, a huge amount of data in terms of someone's sleep whether it's objective or, or subjective sleep data that you're gathering um, and you can make real inferences from that, but it also comes back to the relationship that you have with that athlete, um, because take, taking the data allows you to then have a dialogue about someone's sleep health, rather than just making decisions based on, on what a sleep watch will tell you or what a yeah. questionnaire will tell you. Seven to nine hours, is, is that for everyone? It's totally individualised, but on the whole, yeah, seven to nine hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it comes down to whether you're a lark or an owl as well. So you, something called your chronotype um, oh, really? will have an impact in genetics too. Right. But wow. Generally speaking, seven to nine hours. Yeah. And, and what about, say, take 
um, over in the States, for example, where you're, you're traveling across different time zones, that must completely play havoc with, with yeah. sleep patterns. Yeah, and they do have specialists that advise them. So the problem in the States is they'll cross time zones. They've got East and West um, time zones, and obviously they'll, they'll play in the leagues. And, the, and so you may have you know, a game on you know, West Coast where you're based, and then you may be playing in the week on East Coast. And that really does affect them. Same in Australia as well. So I know a lot of the American teams, basketball and baseball in particular, have been paying particular attention to their sleep strategies to, to the nth degree. Um, and it is, it is planned out within the week as to what the players need to do um, to overcome the, the sleep deprivation and the jet lag that they'd experience on top of a load that, that goes on for months and months through their, their competition schedule. Really, really interesting. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for um, sharing all, all your insight with us. If, if listeners want to find out more about the work that you're doing in relation to this whole area of the importance of, of sleep on performance, what, what's the best place for them to go? Well, I've got my website, which is Gilchrist Performance. Um, also Twitter, Sarah L. Gilchrist, uh, LinkedIn the same. And we've got Gilchrist Performance on Instagram too. Lovely. Um, Dr. Sarah Gilchrist, thank you so much for joining the podcast. No problem, thanks. And so we come to our final guest of the podcast, Alex Cook, a data intelligence partner at PwC UK. Alex leads PwC's work with British Athletics. I'm thrilled that we've got the chance to chat to him about that. But also, it'll be a great opportunity to wrap this whole episode up, understanding how organizations use all the various data sources available to them, including some of those that we've discussed earlier in the show. So uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Alex. Um, some of our listeners might be surprised to hear PwC and sports mentioned within the uh, same sentence so I thought maybe you could start by giving us an overview of how your team is working with British Athletics. Hi Russ, um, well PwC help a lot of elite sports organisations and, and you're right that's you know, typically with big four accountancy services but um, we also help with technology and transformation advisory and that includes using our large contingent of data analytics resources to help clients solve their important problems. We were engaged by British Athletics initially to help them with a strategic review of the way that they collected and managed and stored data. Uh, and in the course of that engagement, uh, myself and the, the late and great Neil Black and Tommy Yaw, who heads up performance support for the World Class Program, started looking at if we could um, use data better, harness the power of data more effectively, what could that do to help them with their mission, which is to win more medals in, in more events? How could we provide insights to athletes and coaches that would help them to perform better? So we, we developed um, a theoretical, a logical model for uh, athlete performance, which we, uh, we called our probabilistic model of, um, of athlete performance. It's a blueprint for how all of the data sources that can be collected with respect to an athlete can come together to help coaches understand what makes a material difference in terms of preparation and training and ultimately performance. Yeah, it includes uh, managing the acquisition of data. Um, some of your, your guests earlier were talking about different sensors that provide data. Um, how do we bring that into an environment where we can include uh, athlete self-reporting and well-being or data that's collected by coaches at the track side or in the gym? and bring that together in such a way that we can provide a suite of standard reports and analysis and deep data science to really get to understand what what drives performance it's been a great experience so far um you know we're finding that their their values as a as an organization you know closely relate to ours um, we're all about solving you know, problems in society in this case it's you know helping uh, a nation's iconic sports perform better can, can you share some examples of where your work has actually you know you've seen an impact on, on a particular athlete or, or, or one of the sports involved yeah I mean we're seeing impacts all, all, all over the all over the program I mean a, a particular example might be with you know respect to injury prevention so when you have a real deep set of data longitudinal over a number of years you're able to look at the relationship between particular types of training exercises so that might be um, you know, the nature of the exercise itself. Where, you know, if it's in the gym, 
then you know, the, the type of movement, whether it's a squat, whether it's a counter movement jump, um, the number of reps and sets, the weights that he used, the duration, the rest time, etc. cetera. Um, and over, over the course of time, where injuries have occurred, you can look back at the data and look at what preceded either a chronic or an you know, acute um, stress in the, in the weeks prior and compare that to a control set of data for the same athlete, i.e. where they didn't have an injury. Um, and that helps you understand where there are combinations of exercises, combinations of training or rest or, or other patterns that are contributing to that injury. And in the case of you know, one particular athlete, we found some very clear relationships between um, Achilles injuries and particular uh, exercises on, a, on an exercise bike and high intensity hack squats. Um, and hamstring injuries that were um, you know, caused by the, the frequency of um, weight lifts in the gym and um, exercises that they were doing with a shot put ball thrown between the legs. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's quite specific in terms of the, the exercises they're doing and the types of injury we're able to identify. Now, of course, armed with that information, the coach can be a little bit more careful about how those exercises are introduced to, to the athlete's training. So on the subject of um, injuries, actually, Chris Turner talked earlier about the impact, you know, these long layoffs from sport can have on, on, on potential injuries. So he was talking about, um, you know, the example from NFL in 2011. And then just recently as the Bundesliga came back, they've already seen, you know, an, an, an increase in, in um, injuries, um, you know, as, as they've returned to playing football in Germany. Have you been looking at how, the COVID-19 lockdown is affecting British athletics training? Yeah, I mean, our job for us is to provide um, you know, technology support and data science support. We're not, the, we're not the sports scientists and we're not the coaches. Um, so the business understanding here comes from those guys. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we've been providing data throughout lockdown that helps those coaches to understand uh, what's currently happening within their um, their athletes' training uh, and with their response to that training. This is really important because you know, there are limitations on what athletes can do. You know, if you're a um, pole vaulter, um, you know, uh, with the exception of a few a few of the athletes in the world, you haven't got you know a, a, a pole vault mat in your back garden. No, you, know, I and you haven't got the to run up. So, and you can't just go down to your local park and start you know, lobbing javelins around. Um, so there are certain exercises and certain specific um, drills that you just can't do in, in lockdown. Uh, and coaches have to adjust for that. And they adjust for that by trying to mimic um, the same actions on the body through other exercises and drills. Uh, and by measuring the response to that, they can uh, have an understanding of how their athletes react. Now, this will be important when athletes return to those sorts of drills and start preparing for the specifics of, of their event, particularly those those. Uh, throws and jumpers um, and there'll be a gradual reintroduction of those particular types of drills all the time the coaches will be monitoring um, you know some of the uh, data measurements that relate to uh, performance indicators as to how they'll be able to achieve so for example if I'm demonstrating a, a reduction in lower leg strength then you know I might reduce the uh, the intensity of the high jumpers uh, jumping workout what about the work that you're doing with um, our Paralympians as, as well? I'm quite keen to hear about some of that, that as well. Yeah, we, we're seeing a, a growing parity in the levels of support that are provided to Paralympians. And you know, an example of that, um, we've introduced some biomechanics analysis. Now, uh, typically um, taking video of an athlete and uh, analysing that for... Uh, biomechanical um, you know measurements so you know the angles and um, the speed of limbs and uh, you know how they associate with particular movements maybe it's uh, sprinting off the blocks or uh, throwing a shot put um, that would take hours maybe days um, with you know a trained individual having to individually mark up specific videos and then calculate the measurements from that marked up video terribly manual activity. Um, using uh, recent computer vision algorithms, we're able, now able to do that in a couple of minutes. And the, uh, the first place we, we looked to provide that capability was with one of our uh, Paralympian throwers. And for the main reason that 
they don't have the resources to be able to perform the same amount of uh, analysis manually. Yeah, so we were looking for a real quick way of providing them with a similar type of insight to some of the other athletes, but without having to you know, spend a lot of resources on trying to achieve that. Um, in my chat with uh, Dr. Sarah Gilchrist, I know you've had a chance to, to listen to, to the, the previous interviews. Um, she, she was talking about, you know, it's very easy to have death by data. And, in, you know, in, in that you're just seeing the numbers, but you need to remember that there is that human being at, at the end of all this, you know, or, or obviously in some cases in team sports, you know, a combination of, of humans. What's your view on, on balancing all the data intelligence that you're providing, you know, together with that, that coach's in, intuition? Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting challenge because actually you know, too much data can be a dangerous thing. Um, you know, one of the challenges within the world-class program was that you had individuals with different types of data that would use that single view to, uh, you know, to make assumptions about how an athlete was performing or trending. Um, you know, e equally, for us to get to the, you know, the cohesive whole, a fully integrated data set around this human system, will take us years and years and years, uh, and arguably may never happen. Um, so how do you bridge the gap between a fully machine learning, computer uh, analytics driven view of performance and where we were in the past with coaches with stopwatches and um, you know, pads and paper, uh, which you know, to a degree still happens today. And the answer is to try and help those coaches and those athletes become more data informed. So by bringing relevant data sets and reports and, and analysis to sit alongside some of the work they're already doing today, we allow them to use their intuition guided by um, some of the evidence points. Right. And of course, you, know, you have to start with data that you know, has a defined veracity to it. You know, we need to make sure data is, is of the right quality. We need to make sure that it's um, collected at the right frequency. Um, you know, we, we're dealing with sports scientists and coaches here who have a critical eye for detail. Um, and it's really important that we build their trust by focusing on the data that we know that matters and that we know is, is accurate. That allows them to use that data alongside their intuition to help guide the actions they're taking with the athletes. Brilliant. Um, just want to finish off, um, Alex, by you know, looking forward. How, how do you think this whole area of data analytics in sport will develop in the future? But, and, and also, what major trends are, are you seeing? Now, we, we started our relationship with British Athletics by leveraging thinking and philosophy and mathematical techniques that have been used in consumer products and retail for over 25 years now in, in marketing modeling. Um, I, was, I was amazed at, honestly, just how far behind elite sport was from some of you know, other industries in the world. Um, so I expect a rapid catch up. Uh, if I think about a different sport, you know, when we're looking at football at the moment, um, there are some really great examples of data being captured um, you know, using uh, tracking mechanisms, so GPS and players moving around a pitch or from analyzing video for the, for the same output. Um, there's a whole industry around event data, um, you know, who, who passed to whom and who had a shot and where was the shot from. And you know, we, we talk about you know, expected goals and, and things like that. Um, the same challenge exists across all of sport, which is how do I bring all of those data points together to really understand the complex interactions around a single human system in the case of athletics or um, the team dynamics in the case of football. And that's where I think we'll see a significant growth. The technology and the techniques exist for us to be able to do that. Um, the advances in cloud computing, the advances in uh, mathematical modeling allow us to capture the insights from those uh, data streams in a way that we've never been able to before at this scale. And that affords a huge amount of opportunity uh, to bring more data and more computational processing to trying to answer those those critically important questions there's lots of resource if we can build the trust and um, work closely with the management teams and the coaches then then i, I think we're going to see this area grow hugely fascinating stuff and a brilliant wrap up to this whole podcast um alex if uh, listeners want to find out more about pwc's work with british athletics where can they go uh, we've got a microsite on the PwC website, so www.pwc.co.uk forward slash British Athletics. Alex Cook, uh, thank you for joining the show. My pleasure, Russell.